know God, love God, and serve God. We need to know who we are, love one another, and serve one another. be wielding the sword of the Word of God like Jesus Christ did when He was in the wilderness and the devil came to take Him out. Go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Last book of the Bible. Hallelujah. A king that would die for his kingdom. A father that would send his son to rescue sinners. When I was an enemy, he died for me. The Bible says. He didn't die for me because I deserved it. He died for me because he loved me. Glory to God. Look at verse 8. Well, let's look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds of chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. And every eye will see him, and they also who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Say Almighty. He's Almighty. So no matter what you're going through, you need to give it to Almighty God. He is the Lord of hosts. Amen. King of kings. And it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation. Anybody has some trouble? John said, I have trouble too. I'm your brother in tribulation and in the kingdom of God and in the patience or perseverance of Jesus Christ. Was on the island of Patmos, which is on the island which is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, he was put in prison and he was condemned still. Because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these apostles gave their lives for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To preach the resurrection in the kingdom of God. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And when I turned, and saw, saw, when I, turned I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girt about his chest with a golden band. How many of you know who he's looking at? He's looking at Jesus. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. Just think looking into the face of Jesus, the resurrected eternal one, God looking into the face of God, his eyes burning with passion for you. He loves you so much. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Man, what a sight to see. To see Jesus in all of his glory. When he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John just got a little, a little sneak peek of some of this. Isn't this awesome? This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Whew. I guess I would too. Amen. But he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. So, yeah, Almighty God is going to reach out and touch you and say, don't be afraid. All of this glory is not to hurt us, it's to help us. 
This resurrected Lord, this almighty, powerful God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but, but through Him we would be delivered and saved. So whatever you in, He's big enough to get you out of it. He's almighty God. He knows the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and everything in between. Can, can I add that in there? I am He who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. So he's letting us know, I'm the one who died. I was alive. I died on the cross for you. I was dead. But now I am alive and I will never die again. Never will I die again. There's no one going to kill Jesus again. And that's what it said. That's the next verse. Amen. And he says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. He says, write these things which you have seen and the things which, you, uh, which are and the things which will take place after this. And the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, these are the seven, go and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels to the churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. The messengers to the church are in the hands of Jesus. I'm a messenger. See, angel means messenger. That's what it simply means in English. You know, when you go out to be a messenger for Jesus, you're an angel. You're a sent one. You're terrestrial. You're not celestial. See, you're, you're natural. You're not supernatural yet. Amen? But the, that word angel, is, if you look at it in the Greek, it just simply means a messenger. There's heavenly messengers and earthly messengers. Anybody knows that what I'm saying is true? You ever looked it up? Some of y'all ever looked at some Greek of this before? Now I want you to go with me again to John chapter 1. I want to take off where I left off last week. Now this almighty God is in control. Jesus Christ is alive. He's in our midst. He's in the midst of the lampstands. You saw that? He's in the midst of the church. He's, he's walking back and forth, to and fro. He's still ministering to the church. He's still wanting to serve us, deliver us. He wants the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened. He wants us to know who He really is, what we have and what we can do in Him. But we've we got to let our God, God get bigger than we are. So John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came to bear witness, to bear witness of the light. That all, say all. all, God wants all to be saved, amen? He says that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And it says that was the true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world. Say every man. Amen. So he comes to give light to every person who comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the power or the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were not born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Y'all ever heard that before? Not just born of flesh or, or of man, but you must be born of the Spirit of God. You must be born again. And the way you get born again is He brings light to you and you receive that light by faith. And by faith, He gives you the power to become sons and daughters of God. So again, I'm talking about the ultimate intention of God. The ultimate purpose of God was what? That He would have a family. And it's so clear and powerful in the Scripture when you see it. Look at verse 14. And the Word became flesh. This is so important. So the Word of God is who? He's a person. It's Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Go with me to the book of Hebrews now. 
chapter 1. Father, I thank you for the anointing on your word, the anointing in this place. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just make Jesus bigger in us, in our thinking, in our hearts, in our lives, that we would see him for who he really is. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Start with verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. I love this, this portion of Scripture. This is so good. God. You know what it always says? In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. This one just starts with God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. The prophets are the ones who wrote in here. This is the law and the prophets, this book right here. You see? And he spoke to us through the prophets. And he spoke to our fathers through the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. God's son is speaking to us. Can you see that? In these last days. Has spoken to us by his son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things. Through whom also he made the worlds. So he's just said Jesus Christ. How many of you know Jesus Christ is the son of God? He said he's speaking to us through Jesus. And when we see Jesus for who he is, we're going, to ho- we're going to learn a whole lot about ourselves, what we have and what we can do. We need Jesus to become bigger in our thinking than he is. Jesus Christ is God, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen? And he is the heir of all things. Say heir of all things. Everything belongs to Jesus. And I've been redeemed by his blood. I've been purchased by his blood. I belong to Jesus. Anybody else here belongs to Jesus? I don't belong to myself. I belong to him who died for me and rose again. I'm not supposed to be after my own earthly life. I'm supposed to give up my earthly life so I can find my heavenly life. He says, if I lose my earthly life, I'll really find my life. But if I want my earthly life, I'll really lose my heavenly life, my eternal purpose that God has for me. That's what he says when he says that. He says he's the heir of all things through whom he also made the worlds. So everything that was created was created through Jesus Christ. Do y'all see that? God did it through Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus is the brightness of almighty God's glory, and the expressed image of his purpose, person I mean, and upholding all things, say all things, by the word of his power. How many of you know that God's word is powerful? Amen? When he had by himself, now see that, uh, I would underline that, by himself, say by himself. My salvation isn't me, it was something he did. He by himself purged my sins. Isn't that what it says? That he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ made a covenant with God and man inside of himself because he was God and man. Y'all want to know what God looks like? I mean, I would like to see what God looks like. Look at me. He looks a whole lot like me. I was created in his image and in, in his likeness. Look at your neighbor. Say, so you look a whole lot like God. We are his sons and daughters. See, that blows our mind. We, we, so people, That's blasphemy. Are you saying you're God? No. He's king of kings. So who's the king he's king over? He's Lord of Lords. Amen? We're created in His image and in His likeness, and He's given us dominion. He's given us authority over all the works of His hands. We are the expressed image of Him, the reflection of Him. Jesus Christ was a man. Some of y'all might have thought He was good looking. Some of y'all might not think He was good looking. The Bible said there was nothing about Him that made Him stand out more than any other man. Y'all know it says that in Ephesians, I mean in in, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, when it talks about him going to the cross. He was a man, anointed of God, but he was the God-man, begotten of the Father. He was not born with sin like you and me, because the Holy Spirit moved on Mary, and that which she conceived was from the Most High. It was the Son of God. 
And he was born into the world, and the word became flesh. And he, he was born just like you were born. He came through the womb of his mother. And she had to nurse him and take care of him. And says, blessed is the woman who does this. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. That's in the scripture. Amen? Now, if you keep on going, we might get off the scripture. But that part's in the scripture. Somebody say amen. amen. He was a baby. Almighty God became vulnerable, became a baby. But let me tell you, God the Father had angels, had plans, had dreams and visions. He, he had an ultimate intention that nothing was going to stop. How many of you know this part of God's will nobody's going to stop? It's not up to us. That's why we ought to say right now, not my will, but thy will be done. Because your will is going to be done anyway, God. And I want to participate in what you have for me. And this is his ultimate intention. And we're going to read a little bit further in the, in the next chapter. To bring many sons to glory. That means daughters too. In that context, he's talking about many sons and daughters to glory. Jesus came to redeem us. He became a man and dwelt among us. He died on a cross and shed his blood for us, for our sins to be forgiven. He was buried and he was raised from the grave to bring us everlasting life. And he took Hades and hell and death in his hands. He's got the keys of it all. And he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And we don't need to be afraid and strive and worry about anything because he's Almighty God and we belong to him. Rest in him. Stop striving to please Him and believe in Him and fall in love with Him. Because the whole thing in the Bible is a love story. He loved us first, right? And He came and He died for us. And He says, here's the, here's the, the simple commandment right here. here. It wraps it all up. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love one another. You know, I was meeting with some pastors today and they was talking about problems in the church. They said, how do you fix those problems? How do you get that dissension out? How do you get that prejudice out? What, I, I said, it's real simple. It's called L-O-V-E. It's, it's called loving one another. But really loving one another. Not some kind of religious love or, or eros love with a hook in it. But truly quit judging one another, loving one another, praying for one another, building each other up in the Lord. I mean, that's the greatest compliment I get about the church. People who come here, they say, man, you just feel like you just met a family. You, you're, you're comfortable at home. People accept you for who you are. They're not judging you. You can feel the love of God in this place. It's love. Love never fails. So he upholds all things by the word of his power, and he has by himself purged our sin and sat down at the right hand of the Father, or, I mean, right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Listen to what this says. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be my son. I am a son. Have you all ever had the witness of the Spirit let you know that you're his daughter, you're his son? Come on. We have any daughters of God in here? You are a princess. Any sons of God in here? Now, he, see, he never said that to the angels. The angels are created being. We are begotten of God. Amen? Amen? Ooh, glory to God. I wanna, don't want to get ahead of myself. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. What happened when Jesus was born? The shepherds saw what? The angels worshiping. Amen? The angels worship. The angels, look at the last verse of this chapter, verse uh, 14. Talking about the angels. It says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? So the angels are all here to minister to us. That's why we don't worship angels. Amen. Now look at, look at verse 8. 
But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. So right here, God is calling Jesus God. Do, do y'all see that? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and your scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. In other words, your kingdom is all about doing things right. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. We have to be like this, sons and daughters of God. We should love what is right and hate lawlessness. And that's why we struggle in our own self because we're still in this natural world. And here we are trying to love God and then we still have these fleshly tendencies and these other things that want to pull us away. But we've got to learn to love what God loves, love righteousness, and hate what God hates. He hates lying. He hates manipulation. He hates murder. Amen? He hates lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will grow old like an old garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. Aren't you glad that things are going to change? Amen. Y'all understand what he's saying right here? He says, but you are the same. How many of you know Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And your years will never fail. But I'm in him. You know this earth, this heaven and earth that we're dealing with right now? God's going to fold it up one day like an old garment and put it up. And he's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. There's going to be no... Junk like you see. Amen? No unrighteousness is going to enter into that kingdom. No liar. Amen? So, Lord, help us to walk out our sonship by the power of your Holy Spirit. So I'm glad it's going to change. I can't wait till it's all changed. So, so don't worry about global warming. It's, it says right here it's growing older. You know, every day this earth gets older and old, older. And in other words, you know, evolution, how we're supposed to be evolving into better and better. How many of you recognize it's getting worse and worse? So evolution is kind of backwards. It's really devolution. It's devolving. Amen. Just because we adapt a little bit, you know, we stand in the sun a little longer and our skin gets a little darker. God just made us that way for a reason. Amen? Amen? That's not evolution. That's the plan of God. That's architecture already built into the creation. Nothing changes genetically. They, they can't prove it. And they think that we're idiots because we believe in a creator. Praise God. He says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. In other words, if you don't listen and don't really take heed to, to, to learning about Jesus Christ and who you are, you will drift away. How many of y'all know if you stop reading your Bible, stop going to church and, and stop, you end up drifting away? It's called backsliding. you got to feed your spirit man. Take earnest heed to the things of God. Amen? Amen. And I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all are the ones here on Wednesday night. Listening and feeding your spirit. Okay? He says, For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, excuse me, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Now listen, God also bearing witness, proving that Jesus is who he says he is, both with signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Spirit according to his will. God proved to the world that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Savior. There is evidence that there was a man named Jesus who came and died on the cross. And look around. Even the date 
that we have, we, we date by Jesus' coming into the world. This man, Jesus, is the most significant man that has ever been born and ever lived on the planet. By a long shot. They've tried to destroy him and they cannot. They've tried to destroy his word and they cannot. They're trying to stop us and they cannot. Don't let them. Amen. No one can take your faith from you. Steal your faith away. But God wants to bear witness of who Jesus Christ is in us and through us with signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, I don't want to be used of God to do signs and wonders and various miracles, letting the gifts of the Spirit work in you. Well, go to work. What's keeping y'all from doing it? Lay hands on the sick and start praying for them. Start serving other people. God's ready to use you right now. But y'all say, well, I'm not, uh, you know, smart enough or I don't know enough or I'm not holy enough. or I don't. It, you, It's grace. It's the grace of God that's going to work through you. You know, again, I was at this minister's meeting and the, one of the ladies there was bragging about someone who prays seven hours a day. Well, that woman has a reward. Everyone knows she prays seven hours a day. She's a great prayer, so everybody thinks she's real spiritual because she prays seven hours a day. But it, you're not supposed to do it for everybody to know. You're supposed to do it in secretly and go out and perform what God's called you to do, and God will reward you openly. So I don't want to be praying seven hours a day so everybody will know how spiritual I am and everybody talk about, well, our pastor prays seven hours a day. I just want you to know. I want you to know that. So, does work move? Does my works move God or faith moves God? Now, it's okay to pray seven hours a day, but do it in secret so God can reward you openly. Amen? Amen. And so I actually mentioned something about it. I said, God doesn't move because we work. God moves in His grace because we believe. Amen. And that's what I really believe. It, it, it's faith in His grace that moves Him. Amen. Now, does that mean we shouldn't pray? No, we should pray. We should pray even more earnestly. But I don't, I, I wonder if a person that says, I'm going to pray seven hours a day, if they actually turn the clock on and they watch it for seven hours and pray and pray and pray and pray so that they can, right when that seven hour hits, whew, I got my seven hours in. So now I can keep my testimony if I pray seven hours a day. You know what I like is whenever you get up and you start talking to God and you start praying and maybe you was going to have a time to do 15 minutes, but next thing you know, you've been praying for an hour. See, it just flowed. It was just flowing. It was not the law. It was relationship. You see the difference? But when you have relationship, you need to make time to spend time with the person you love. I mean, how can I have a relationship with Mary if I never spend time with Mary? I get up in the morning and say, hey, baby, have a good day. Take off and do my own thing. That's some of our relationship with God. Good morning, Lord. Uh, bless my day in Jesus' name. Amen. Take off. Don't think about him. Talk to him or, or let him be part of your life the whole day. See, you can be in prayer all day if you know that God's with you. Praying always. With all prayer and supplication. Considering that God is not only walking beside me, he's in me. And he wants to confirm his word right here with signs and wonders and miracles that follow. And he wants us to be part of that. Amen? He wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can be part of that. Look at verse 5. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Now that word angels there was, is, should have been translated Elohim, or God. It's the same word used in the Old Testament for God. He made us a little lower than God, amen, and crowned us with glory and honor. Now, the only reason, as I've been looking at this, the only reason I think the translators use the word angels is because angels don't die. They're celestial. We do die. 
So he, in, in some kind of way, God and his plan made us a little lower than the angels because we, we, we die. We're going to physically die unless the Lord comes. And the Lord Jesus comes to the earth and submits himself, and it says the same thing, a little lower than the angels, so that he could die and identify with us through his death. So that, that's the only reason I can see why they did not translate that word into Elohim or God, that they translated it into angels. How many of you understood what I just said? So keep that in mind as we just read through this portion right here. And he says, He crowned them with, with uh, glory and honor, and has set him over the works of his hands. God has set me over the works of his hands. I love the scripture. What is man that you're mindful of him? Almighty God, the creator of all things, all things were made through him. What is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels, but you crowned him with glory and honor. And you, given, you made him a uh, uh, ruler over all the works of your hands. Well, we're sons and daughters. That's what we are. Okay? And he says, and have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. I mean, I can still see sin in the world. So this thing's not over with yet. He did not wrap up the garment and put it up yet. It's getting close, though. I hope Jesus comes soon. Anybody else ready for Jesus to come? Amen. Wrap this thing up. He says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So Jesus became a man, a mortal man, a flesh and blood man, so that he could pour out that blood, that mortal part, for the sins of the whole world. That he would taste death for all of us. Almighty God loved you so much, he died in your place. And he tells us what the ultimate intention is right here. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. He suffered and it was a perfect sacrifice so that he could make all of us bring many sons into glory with him. So the ultimate intention, when we're, doing it, when we're living this life, we need to keep in mind that God is really wanting us to see that we are part of his family. And that he, he can sympathize with us. That's what he goes on if you read the rest of this chapter. He, look, look at verse 14. And as much as the children have... have uh, partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. In other words, his children became flesh and blood, so what he did, he said, I'll become flesh and blood too. Now he's glorified, and guess what? We're going to be glorified just like him because we are his children. He says, uh, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Anybody in here afraid to die? Don't be. It's just a transition from this life to the eternal life that God has for you. And so don't be uh, bound up and in bondage to the fear of death all of your life. And see, it's, again, he talks about the angels. Verse 16, I'll be coming to a close at the end of this chapter. For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham, to the people of faith, is what that means. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation, to pay the price that needed to be paid for the sins of the people, is what that means. And in that he himself has suffer, suffered being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. Aren't you glad that when you're tempted, Jesus is not running from you, he's running to you to help you? With every temptation, God makes a way of escape. 
I know I did a little bit more teaching tonight than preaching and reading a lot of scripture, but get into the word. I mean, these scriptures right here tell you how grand and how powerful and how big Jesus Christ really is. And I got a whole lot more scriptures right here I could read to you about how awesome he is. That all of this is according to his will. That when Adam and Eve ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God didn't say, oh, we need to kick in plan B and find out, you know, what we're going to do to save man. So to wrap it up, I, I said this would be the last one. I have to read one more scripture. Y'all forgive me, okay? Go to uh, Revelation again, chapter 13. Before the foundations of the world, before we were even created, the redemption plan was already set in place. So all what we're going through is not an accident. That's why you need to say when you're going through tribulation, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And when you're being tempted, don't run from God, run to God, knowing that he can sympathize with you when you're weak because he became just like you, flesh and blood, and he suffered and died so that you could be free from your sin. Look at verse 8. Revelation 13, 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life slain from the foundation of the world. Now, in context, it's talking about those in the earth whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be worshiping the beast. But the part I want you to see is the Lamb's book of life that was slain from the foundation of the world. The redemption was already set in place before he ever created anything. He had the plan already there because he knew that we were going to do our own thing and he was going to have to rescue us. And he really did. How many of y'all love Jesus Christ for what he's done for you? Amen. Give him praise tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. We praise you tonight, God. Thank you for all that you've done. Father, we thank you that your ultimate plan, your ultimate intention is working in our lives. And God, that we are your sons and your daughters. God, help us to be obedient sons and daughters and not disobedient. Help us to learn to sow your word and reap that which gives glory to you, life, instead of sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. Lead us and guide us I pray the prayer that Paul prayed, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would know who you are, know your calling for our lives, know the inheritance that you have in the saints, and know the power that works in us who believe. The same power that raised you from the dead, Lord, is working in our own lives tonight. Let that resurrection life transform us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. But the most important question is, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? I want to ask you, do you know that if you would die right now that you would go to heaven? Have you really put your faith in the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross for you? It's very simple what the scripture says about being saved. It says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that you shall be saved. So today, why don't you take time to stop right now and ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Simply pray a prayer like this. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. I know that you died on the cross for me, that you was buried and that God raised you from the dead. And today I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I receive forgiveness of my sins today. Thank you for saving me. Now, my friend, if you just prayed that prayer from your heart, that means you are now a son or a daughter of God. Get in a good Bible-believing church. There's several great churches in our community that will serve you. You need to get into the Word of God and grow as a Christian. Don't just stop with that one prayer. Keep on going. And I want to thank you again for watching our broadcast. Remember, God knows everything about you and loves you anyway.